Okay, some of the most important yet unsung heroes of communication are conjunctions. Conjunctions are very small little world, words, but without conjunctions, you wouldn't understand the relationship between words and clauses and phrases. Conjunctions help us move from one part of a thought to another. And sometimes they will work in such a way that you think you're going to go this way and they bring you to a screeching halt and take you a different, completely different direction. For instance, last week, I won a million dollars. And I want to share it with you today. But I already spent it. You see, you went from planning your European vacation to, okay, we're eating at Taco Bell again. All because of a little bitty conjunction. Three simple letters. Conjunctions will help you understand what's going on in any kind of communication. God is the master at conjunctions. Here's the truth. I'm a sinner, and so are you. The debt we owe because of our sin before God is insurmountable. Look at Ephesians 2, though. Look at how God intervenes, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. Conjunctions are super important. Now, the passage we're going to look at today in Judges chapter 10 reveals to us five lessons that I'm going to tie together with four conjunctions that will lead us to one takeaway. Now, unless we understand the first four lessons and how they all tie together, the weight of the last lesson, which is the takeaway, won't mean anything to us. It won't make any difference. You see, the Bible was written by a logical God who inspired every single word. And what we need to understand is there's nothing in there that he, that's there by accident. And as we've seen as we've gone through Judges, every once in a while you'll find a verse and you're like, why in the world is that there? After the story of Abimelech, we found some things at the very end. After the story of Ehud, we found some things at the very end. And today, again, we're going to find some things at the very end of this section that don't make a lot of sense, but the conjunctions will tie them all together and will draw us to this one major takeaway that we're going to enjoy together. So turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 6. And I want to, I want to just point out how conjunctions in these first few verses tie everything together and help us understand how Israel got into the situation she finds herself in. We'll start in verse 6. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, the gods of the Philistines. And because the Israelites forsook the Lord, no longer served him, he became angry with them. He sold them into the hands of the Philistines and the Ammonites. Now, because they no longer served him, he sold them into spiritual slavery. And the Ammonites, verse 8 says, that year shattered and crushed them. For 18 years, they oppressed all the Israelites on the, side of the, the east side of the Jordan and Gilead, the land of the Amorites. The Ammonites also crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim. And Israel was in great distress. So because they turned away, they were crushed, they were shattered for 18 years in great distress. Then, verse 10 says, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, We have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. The Lord replied, now catch this, when the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maonites oppressed you, and you cried to me for help, did I not save you from their hands? But you have forsaken me, served other gods, so
so I will no longer save you. And then he says, I gave you what you wanted. Go and cry out to the gods that I gave you, that you wanted, that you chose. Let them save you when you're in trouble. But, really critical juncture in the life of Israel and in the life of every single one of us. There's an old, old hymn that says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the Lord I love. That's a good description of our hearts. We are prone to wander. And so we need to remember that when we, even though we are prone to wander, if we will turn back to God, he has something that he will say to us. He already said, go to your gods, cry out to them, let them deliver you. But the Israelites said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us. And here's the critical conjunction. Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them and served the Lord. And he could bear Israel's misery no longer. The first lesson that we need to grasp from this passage, and you see it all throughout the Bible, a good chapter for you to see this on your own would be Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to the end of the chapter. The first lesson is simply this. The worst thing God can do for you is give you what you want. The worst thing God can do for you is give you what you want. He gave Israel what they wanted. He let them worship other gods and they for 18 years were shattered and crushed and serving under the heavy hand of the Ammonites. Go cry out to your new gods for their help. Let them deliver you. Now here's the thing. God is not rubbing their nose in their defiance. God's heart aches when we choose to walk away from him. God doesn't tell us that we're supposed to praise him because he needs an ego boost. God tells us to praise him because he knows that that's where fulfillment is. That's where contentment is. It will only be in who he is. And when we realize that he is the one that fills us with with joy and contentment and fullness of everything, no matter what's happening around us, that's when we come to the to what he really wants us to have that abundant life that Jesus talked about in John chapter 10 you are experiencing lesson number 1 if you're walking through this world and you're showing up to church on Sunday you're doing a few things maybe you're involved in a ministry whether you're on campus or or somewhere else um, and you're you're just kind of doing those Christian kinds of things and then you live your life the way you want. You kind of disregard God throughout the week. You're kind of living in lesson one. God is not going to stop you if you want to make a choice against him. Now the spirit who lives inside of you if you're a follower of Jesus will convict you. He will prod you. But we can grieve the spirit. We can say no thank you and we can make the choices we want to make and we can live in lesson one but God's heart for you and me and the heart that we see for of God in this passage comes out to us in the next verse as we run headlong into the open arms of lesson two look at verse 15 But the Israelites said to the Lord, We have sinned. Do with us whatever you think best, but please rescue us now. Then they got rid of the foreign gods among them, and they served God, and he could bear their misery no longer. Lesson two. It's never too late to repent. It's never too late to turn back to God. I mean, think about it. 
How many of you have ever heard God say something to you? I mean, audibly you heard the voice. Okay? Every once in a while we hear those whispers, right? And sometimes God says something to us through the word. Sometimes he'll use circumstances. Sometimes he'll use people. But he speaks to us. Imagine if God said to you, I'm not going to help you anymore. Go cry out to the money that you chose over me. Cry out to the position at work that you chose over me. Cry out to the power that you wanted in the community. Cry out to those things over me instead of me because I'm not going to save you anymore. What would you do? I would kind of think I'm, I'm, I'm done. I kept nowhere to go. Israel didn't do that. And we need to not do that. As long as there's breath in your body, it's not too late to repent. Who knows if God might not restore because God is all about forgiveness. He's all about restoring us back to that place. Now, I want to be really careful here. If you're a follower of Jesus and you sin, and you will, 1 John 1, 7 says that, uh, you know, if we say that we don't have sin, it's, it's a book written to Christians. If we say that we have no sin, then we're lying. The truth isn't in us. We're not being honest, being disingenuous. But as a follower of Jesus, if the Holy Spirit is in you and you sin, it doesn't mean he kicks you out of the family. It means that your relationship with him is broken right then, and you need to restore that relationship so that the free communication and God's work in your life can continue to make you stronger and more like Christ. Listen to what he says to each of us, whether we're believers or not believers. He says this about our repentance. The Lord does not delay. This is the amplified version of, of the New Testament. The Lord does not delay as though he were unable to act and is not slow about his promise as though as some count slowness, but is extraordinarily patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. It took Israel 18 years, shattered, crushed, and in great distress. How long will you wander in the desert, eating fruitless cactus, choking on the dust in that far land away from God? If you've got something going on in your life and God is saying to you, you know what? I, I want us to be closer. We need to deal with this thing. Don't wait. It's never too late to repent. It's never too late to turn away from the evil choices we make in our lives. Somebody once said that the wheels of God's justice grind slow, but they grind exceeding fine. God would have us instead choose mercy and not justice. For his anger, Psalm 30, verse 5 says, last only a moment, but his favor lasts for a lifetime. The Ammonite army came to make war against Israel. But the Israelis did not have a general. They didn't have anyone to lead their army. But there was a man named Jephthah. Jephthah was the eldest son of a prominent Gileadite family. He was uh, an experienced warrior. He was the natural choice to be the leader of, the, the, of, of Israel's army. The only problem was... Jephthah was a son of a prostitute. And as his family, as his brothers grew, he's the eldest son. And as his brothers grew older, they eventually ran him out of the house. They wanted nothing to do with him. They were ashamed of him. Does that sound familiar at all? Last week, we talked about a guy named Abimelech. Abimelech was not the son of a prostitute. He was the son of a concubine. A concubine was not an official wife, but a concubine was not also a prostitute. So on, on the socially acceptable scale, you'd have the legitimate wife, you'd have the concubine, and then you'd have, well, the prostitute wouldn't even be on the scale, completely not acceptable. 
Remember what Abimelech did? Abimelech was so upset that he got run out of the family and that he got disowned and disinherited that when he was able to figure out a way to do it, he went and he slaughtered 69 of his 70 brothers to take out all the competition because he wanted to be king. The only reason he didn't, he didn't kill all 70 was because one of them went away and hid. So Jephthah, Jephthah had a score to settle because Abimelech did not grow up in his father's house, but Jephthah did. And it wasn't until the other brothers got older that they were, I, I assume, tough enough to run him off. Look at what it says in verse 2 of chapter 11. When they were grown up, they drove Jephthah away. You are not going to get any inheritance in our family, they said, because you are the son of another woman. You can imagine the way they spit those words out, especially the word another. There was some sort of connotation because his mother was a prostitute, and it was a shame. So the stage is set for a showdown. But listen to his response. They come to him with this. They, they've run him out. They've disinherited. They, they've disowned him. And then they come to him with this, with this audacious request. Come lead our army. He responds this way. Didn't you hate me and drive me away from my father's house? Why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? I didn't, re I didn't notice this till this morning. As I was praying through this passage and, and reading it over. They're doing to him what Israel did to God. Israel said, no, thank you, God. And then, oh, wait a minute, we're in trouble. Help, God. And that's exactly what the people of Gilead were doing. These brothers, as well as the leaders of Gilead, they had run him off. He had been disowned. He had been disinherited. He had been run out of town, and he now had a score to settle. His was a different response, though, than Abimelech's. Look at verse 9. Jephthah answered, Suppose you take me back to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them to me. Will I really be your head? The elders of Gilead replied, The Lord is our witness. We will certainly do as you say. So Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and commander over them, and he repeated all his words before the Lord in Mizpah. Mizpah was his hometown. And to repeat them before the Lord meant that all the people of the city heard him say this. And he was making this solemn vow, I will do what you ask me to do. Which leads me to our third lesson. Because Jephthah is a great example of this third lesson. The first lesson is, God doesn't do us any favors to give us all the things that we want. The second lesson is, it's never too late to repent. And lesson three is simply this. Forgive and leave vengeance to God. Forgive and leave vengeance to God. You may remember the story of, of Joseph in the book of Genesis. If anybody had been mistreated, it was Joseph. He was the youngest brother. He was having dreams and he, he had the right to remain silent. He just didn't have the ability and he bragged about his dreams to his brothers, and his brothers got fed up with him, and they threw him into a pit. They faked his death, and they sold him into slavery. Well, at the end of his father's life, Joseph had been restored to his father, had been restored to his brothers. Everybody knew who he was in Egypt, where he was second in command under Pharaoh. When his father was about to die, his brothers were worried. They thought to themselves, oh no, now we're going to get our comeuppance. Dad died. And they went to him, begging for their lives, begging for their children's lives. But Joseph understood something that we need to understand. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. It is not ours to repay someone when they wrong us. This is one of the most difficult lessons that any of us will ever live. 
And listen what Joseph said. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You intended to harm me. And then he throws in a conjunction that turns everything on its head. But God intended it for good to accomplish something different. You see, that's the thing. We need to allow to enter into our life experience. We think we have everything wired. We think that we know how things should be, but we don't see the way God sees. And we have to acknowledge, yes, I'm, I'm sick, and I've got these problems, or I'm, I'm in financial straits. My relationships are broken, but... God will always intervene. It may not be the way we want it to be. It may not turn out the way we want it to turn out, but God is sovereign. God is the one who's on the throne of our lives, and we need to allow him to be who he is. Has someone wronged you? Are you carrying around a burden? Could it be that God wants you to forgive? Now, I understand that some things are very deep and very painful, and I don't say this in a glib, uh, cavalier way. If there's something you need to forgive and you can't, talk to someone. Get some godly counsel. Pray with someone about it. Make sure that you're, you're dealing with it because God will be there for you in the midst of that pain. And you will experience him in a way that you never thought you could. I had a deep wrong done to me as a child. And I'm not telling you all about it. But I will tell you the outcome. I brought it to God. And I got some wise counsel. And God set me free. It's not that it didn't happen. It's that I don't hold it against that person anymore. And I don't carry that burden around anymore. God wants to set you and me free so that we can walk in the freeness that, that he has planned for us. The question we have to ask ourselves is, do we understand the depths of our forgiveness? How much we've been forgiven? Do we do we trust that God is good and that he will right every wrong? Do we trust that nothing escapes his notice? Jephthah, somehow, we're not told what process he went through or anything like that, but somehow he was able to forgive and no longer weighed down by the hatred for his brothers, Jephthah wasted no time confronting the enemy at their borders. This is what he says in verse 12 of chapter 11. Then Jephthah sent messengers to the Ammonite king with the question, What do you have against me that you have attacked my country? So what happens is, the, you can read it for yourself, but the Ammonite king accused Israel of stealing all their land. Well, Jephthah answers this ludicrous accusation with a, a history lesson. And he just walks back through and he says, Hey, this is how the land came to be ours. And this is how the, your land came to be you, yours. You take what your God Chemosh says you should have, and we'll take what our God Yahweh says that we should have. Well, it's interesting. It says in the passage that the king of the Ammonites completely disregards what Jephthah says. He doesn't even listen to the words while the messenger's reading to them, reading them to him. And so the foregone conclusion is that they're going to go to war. And this is what Jephthah says. I love this. He says, Let the Lord, the judge, Decide the dispute this day between the Israelites and the Ammonites. We'll, we'll just let God decide it. God was at work in Jephthah. There's a lot of really great things happening in him. But he's also at work through Jephthah. Look at what happens in verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jephthah. He crossed Gilead and Manasseh, passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from there he advanced against the Ammonites. Everything was going great. 
But, you see, conjunctions can turn us in the wrong direction as well. Jephthah decided that he needed to take things into his own hands. And he needed to make a bargain with God. He needed, he needed to hold God hostage to make sure that he got what he wanted because he cared about what other people thought of him. He had just been restored as the leader of this community, and he wanted to be sure that everything went the way he wanted it to go. And the worst thing that God can do is give us what we want. The only attitude God wants from you and me is loving obedience. We do not need to put out a fleece, as we saw earlier that Gideon did. We do not need to make elaborate promises. You see, Jephthah forgot. Jephthah forgot that God healed the relationship with his brothers. That God made him ruler over the nation. Jephthah forgot that God restored his inheritance and then some. Remember his brother said, you're not going to inherit anything? Well, no, he's not. He's going to inherit from the whole nation now because he's the leader. God did that. We just read that God's spirit empowered Jephthah to accomplish this purpose. But because Jephthah lacked faith to believe God, he sacrificed his future on the altar of expediency. And Jephthah, verse 30 says, made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. That sounds like a weird thing to say, right? Who's normally going to come out of the door of your house? Your family. Maybe the family dog, right? No, but during those times, to keep the animals alive from predators and from the elements, they would keep them inside. Their floors were dirt, happily. And so he was just assuming that it would be an animal that would come out. But you know what happens when we assume. The battle went well. Then Jephthah, verse 32 says, went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from Eror to the vicinity of Minith, as far as Abel, Karaman. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. They squashed him. 20 towns, devastated. But Jephthah's lack of faith turned his national victory into a national disgrace and a very personally devastating defeat. Verse 34, when Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter? Dancing to the sound of tambourines, she was his only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, O oh my daughter, you have made me miserable and wretched, because I made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. Now think about this. The victory was already determined before the battle was ever even engaged. But Jephthah took it on himself to secure the win. God, I got this. One commentator said it really well. I, I, I love the way they turned this. Ironically, after resting his case confident with, confidently with Yahweh, the judge Jephthah now slips a bribe under the table. You ever do that? I mean, is God true to his word or not? Can we trust him? Are his promises true? Then why do we doubt? Because we're human. But he's saying to us, that's not who I made you to be. It leads us to lesson four. This is how God wants us to behave in our relationship with him. Pray, obey, and let God decide. Pray, obey, and let God decide. God is true to his word. He will do what he said. We can trust him. What enemy is staring you down right now? Depression? 
discouragement, jealousy, greed, lust. Bring that to God. Bring it to God. Bring it to His Word. What does God's Word say about those things? What does God's Word say about whatever it is you're struggling with? Whatever enemy is staring you down? What is God's promise? What does He say that you can trust Him for? He's saying to us, trust me. Pray, talk to me about it. Now sometimes, like we said, like I said earlier, when we've been wronged and we need to forgive somebody, sometimes we can't figure that out on our own. We need someone to help us. Some of these, lots of these issues are the same way. We need God, godly, wise counsel. That's one of the reasons we have life groups in our church. They're small groups that meet throughout the week in people's homes where you can get to know one another, where, where you're going to be prayed for, where you're going to dig into the scriptures together, and where you'll develop relationships where you can have conversations go a little deeper. I've got a small group that meets with, with three other guys. We meet on Wednesday mornings. We've been meeting about three years now. There's not a thing I can't say to those guys. There's not a dark place in the cellar filled with spiders and creepy things that I haven't allowed those guys to go to with me. I need it. And so do you. And God provides it for us through his word, through other believers. Let's take advantage of that. Let's get to know one another on that kind of level. We're called to be a force for God's grace and golden and beyond by being disciples of Jesus. That's our mission. That's what First Baptist Church is all about. But that only happens if we're being disciples. And one of the ways we encourage discipleship is through our life groups. I'd encourage you to consider being involved in a life group. Pray and obey. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe. He is the sovereign King of your life. So He gets to, to decide. Pray, obey, and trust God. Let Him decide. In the aftermath of Jephthah's sacrifice of his only child, and by the way, lots of different commentators have tried to figure out a way to make this not seem as bad as it was. Remember, we've, we've told you all the way throughout Judges, this tells us just like it is. It doesn't sugarcoat things. As much as I want to believe <clears throat> that Jephthah just kept his daughter as a virgin in his family for the rest of her life, as much as I want to believe that, it sure seems like the text is saying that he actually sacrificed her as a burnt offering. And that became a national disgrace. And the momentum away from God continued to swell. The tribe of Ephraim confronted Jephthah. Why did you go to fight the Ammonites without calling us to go with you? We're going to burn your house down over your head. Now, I don't know if you remember, but this, this tribe of Ephraim has done this before. They, they were upset when Gideon uh, went out to battle, and they said, hey, you didn't call us, and Gideon, he, he, he responded with humility, and he said, you know what? Really sorry about that, but look at all the victories you did. Boy, that nothing com mine's nothing compared to what you did. And he calmed them, and they went away happy. He applied the first half of Proverbs 15, verse 1. It says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Well, Jephthah had had enough. And Jephthah was not about to answer them gently. And he harshly responded to them, which is the second half of Proverbs 15, 1. But a harsh word stirs up anger. And when he did that, he ended up in a fight with the people of Ephraim, people of his own nation. And he slaughtered 42,000 of them. And he was so ruthless that, that they, they did everything they could to not show mercy. When they caught a straggler trying to escape back to their lands, verse 6 of chapter 12 says, they seized them and they killed them at the fords of the Jordan. The water of the Jordan ran red with the blood of Israelite soldiers, killed by Israelite soldiers. 
His rash vow and vindictive temper allowed Jephthah to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Killing his own daughter, cutting off his family line, wiping out 42,000 fellow Israelites. Now the end of the chapter kind of comes rather abruptly. You have three minor judges and 25 years between the end of Jephthah's six-year reign and the end of the chapter. It ends with Israel reeling from leaders whose only concern is to make themselves famous, to make themselves powerful. All we know about Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon, those three judges that come after Jephthah, is how many marriages they arrange to expand their influence and what a show they put on to draw attention to themselves. There's not a mention of God in any of their reigns. There's not a mention of God from, from the end of Jephthah's life to the end of this chapter. The first four lessons lay the foundation for the last. Unless we get them, we won't feel the weight of the last lesson. So the first four, the worst thing God can, can give you is what you want, but it's never too late to repent. And so in that broken time, when you're, when you're struggling and you're hurting, we need to realize that we should forgive. So forgive, leaving vengeance to God, and pray, obey, and let God decide. Because, lesson five concludes, the moment we seek self-promotion, we stop seeking There's only room for one in the throne of our lives. The lesson from Jephthah, Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon is seek God above all else. My simple paraphrase of Matthew 6.33, which is really a kind of a parallel concept to this whole chapter. But Jesus says, seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. So seek God in everything that he is and let him take care of the rest. That's what he's telling us he wants us to do. To seek him above everything else and allow him to take care of everything else. Don't get caught up in trying to take control. Don't get caught up in, in, in deciding that you will call the shots in your life so that you can impress God with your intellect, with your achievement, with your, the number of social media followers you have or, or whatever we look to. The question I think we have to ask ourselves as we think about seeking God is what impresses God? What is it that God is looking for? Isaiah 66 verse 1 says this, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build me? Where will my resting place be? Imagine the tallest building, the most elaborate complex, the most incredible human achievement. All of those things are on this earth. And what does God say of this earth? It's my footstool. Now, he's not saying that because he wants to put down the human achievement. He made us so that we could achieve things, and he wants us to enjoy that. But what he's trying to do is get, help us gain perspective. We are not sovereign, and he is, and we can trust him. Anything we may accomplish on this earth, remember, it's God's footstool. He is sovereign, and we're not. Do you want to know what God is impressed with? What God is looking for in us? Isaiah 66, 2 says this. This is the one I esteem. This is the person I esteem. He or she who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And trembles at my word. God is speaking. Are you listening? God speaks to us, as we said earlier, through his word. He speaks to us through fellow believers. He speaks to us through the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. He speaks to us through the circumstances of our days. If we will but listen, are we listening? Because I want you to know that God is speaking. And he wants to communicate his truth to you. 
Are you trembling with excitement? Are you trembling with joy? Are you trembling with reverent fear? I suspect that many of us in this room don't need to hear me say, you need to be in the Bible. You need to be studying the Word. You've been studying the Word for years. You know the Word. But what we need is to apply the Word that we know. We, most of us, myself, are educated beyond our obedience. I dare say that some of us could not study the Bible for an entire year and not run out of verses we already know that we could just simply apply every day of our lives. That's what he wants us to do. He wants us to not be but just about putting our noses in the book. He wants us to be about letting the book become flesh in us and make us different people. Do you want to impress God? Seek God above all else and leave the outcome in his hands. Let's pray together. God, you you know you know what our hearts are like. And you know that we're here today because we we want to know you better. We want to seek you more. We want to become more like you. Thank you for the the clear and unvarnished story of a man like Jephthah who had really great things going on for him but he made bad choices because it's a lot like us show us God how we have asked you for what we wanted and, and begged and pled and, and, and cajoled and done whatever we could to get what we wanted and help us to know that you have something better for us Help us to, to repent as we need to and turn from those things that are not what you want for us. Continue to work in us, God, so that more than anything else we will seek you because you tell us that we'll seek you and find you when we search for you with all our hearts. And that's what we want. Thank you, God, for speaking to us through your word and thank you for the things that you're prompting each of us to do Give us the courage through the Spirit who lives in us to do those things for your glory because we love you in Jesus' name.